think it's if it, it, it fine is such a word to describe the hire. It's fine. Is that damning with faint praise? <laughs> no, I, I, it's fine. Look, it, is he was he their first option? No, we all know he was not their first option. He was an option, and then whatever went they went through to make this decision, they made the decision that he was the right hire at this time for where they want to go. The Lakers have been down this road before. Many people aren't even thinking about this. Remember 2017? They hired an unknown guy in the front office named Rob Palenka. All he was was an agent of Kobe Bryant for the most part. That, that, that was his big... He worked with Orrin Tellum, but his big claim to fame was he was a sports agent with no experience in the front office. Mm -hmm. It's a different experience when I look at data sheets and scouting reports or who's going to go where in the draft. That's how an agent looks at players. They don't go looking at a player and say, oh, I'm going to find the diamond in the rough. He's going to be the greatest guy in the world playing basketball. That's not... It's different as a general manager. Now, with his tenure as a general manager for the Lakers, what would you say? You would say, he's done pretty good. I mean, he's done... When they've gotten into trouble, he's gotten them out of trouble, right? For the most part. They yep. won the bubble. You were there, Rachel. Mm -hmm. But he's made in-season trades to get them over the hump. All those sorts of things. So they kind of... They know the process. Now they go out and they hire a guy who was a, what are these, 16, 15 years in the NBA? 15 years in the NBA. No, I, I actually have 17 seasons that he played it, in. It's, it's a long 17? time. Yeah. It's a 17? long time. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, so you got a guy 17 years in an NBA with no coaching experience at all, enough playing experience that could potentially carry over into the coaching circle for him. Okay. Now when you think about it, what are they going to do? Who are they going to hire? Are they going to go get all these veteran ex-head coaches that are going to kind of help him out along the way? Is he going to have the sole voice in the locker room as a coach, or does he have to really lean on these guys in the learning process with LeBron James and only, I don't know, two to three years left in his NBA career before he starts to say, you know, I don't want to play anymore. I'm done. You know, I want to go do other things in life. Because when you look at where the Lakers are or where they were, Phil Jackson was the last coach to win 50-plus games outside of Frank Vogel. It took, all, it took them all the way to get to Frank Vogel to get to 50-plus games. You go back to Phil Jackson, that was the last time before Frank Vogel. I mean, that's a long time. Then that was in the... But many people, would, like you, Skip, would say, eh, Mickey Mouse, whatever it was, they won a championship. But then yep. they wind up firing a guy who won the championship. Yep. And then wind up firing a guy who took him to the Western Conference Final, which... In a three-year span, it did, it did, it's just like, what are we doing? So now we got to give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's see where it goes. Let's see the staff they put together. Let's see what happens in free agency at the end of this month. All of those sort of... I don't care about the draft. The free agency is most important. What are they going to do to build around J.J. Redick to get him to be successful in this short window that's left for LeBron James? And then you ask me that question... What do I think about the hire at that point in time? And I could give you a different type of answer. Well, right now, you're just sort of... I'm fine. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, whatever. Whatever. Let's just see what it is. I'm That's... not like... This isn't Pat Riley coming. This is not Phil Jackson coming. You know, this isn't... Hell, it's not Rudy coming. It's not... It's just... Yeah. It's like, you, okay. You, you just damned your team with faint praise, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. may be true, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure okay. I'm not the only person. I would agree with that. Yeah, I don't think yeah. you are because this is a very, very difficult thing to be certain on. It is just such a huge gamble. The metaphor in my head is, say you've got a guy who was a waiter at a restaurant, then he went on to be a food critic, very respected, very good. He's suddenly hired to be the head chef even though he's never worked in a kitchen before. Is, is that going to work? Uh, maybe it becomes the hottest restaurant in town. Maybe it's closed in a month. There is literally no way to know. We can project. We can say, oh, J.J. has this in his favor. Is this against him? But we won't know until he actually does it because he's never done it before. And that's where the Lakers have sort of made an interesting choice here. They've made this huge gamble on their seventh head coach in 13 years. Eighth, if you count that they had an interim head coach for four or five months. Mm -hmm. So this is a point where, as you guys as just showed with all those head coaches that they fired, can they afford to be taking another gamble that in a year might completely blow up in their faces? They've done it. So I, it, it's pretty interesting that this hire and this chance has come at this time. And even J.J., if he was going to be honest with you, 
would be very surprised because I, I want to underline what I'm talking about here with some of JJ's social media. There was a tweet, it was like a little bit more than a year ago. It was in response to the idea that JJ on his podcast had been rallying for Nikola Jokic instead of Joel Embiid for MVP. And, and this fan out there was like, hey, JJ, you know, Embiid made you a lot of money. You should be thankful. Without Embiid, you would just be coaching middle school right now. And JJ's response was amazing. He said, I'm actually coaching eight and nine-year-olds right now. I'm hoping to move up to middle school in three to five years. That was a year and change ago. Oh. So in fact, not three to five years, in a year and change, he is now the head coach of the Lakers, much less middle school. And it's jarring when you see the photos of him with the team he has coached in the past, <laughs> because that's not LeBron James there. Mm. So, so again, <laughs> How much of a gamble we are talking about has to be factored into any analysis of this hire. Mm. Who is he talking to here? Uh, I assume his son. I don't know. Is that uh, Austin Rivers or something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I continue to hear that this move is high risk but high reward. And I got to tell you, I, I get high risk because it's the highest risk. I don't get high reward because how can you know? This move is completely unknowable at this point because you have no track record to go on whatsoever. Even we just watched Joe Missoula win a championship at age 35. And you pointed out, well, they just picked like the fourth assistant down the, yeah, the row. they did. And said, here, you come up and do this out of emergency, obviously, because they had the EMA situation they had to mm -hmm. remedy. And... Yet I look at Joe Missoula's background. For two years, he was the head coach at Fairmont State in West Virginia. And for a year, he was, in, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of years, he was assistant on the Celtics G League team. So he had qu quite a background of growth and education. And, and he had been a head coach. And they were, the, at Fairmont State was 43 and 17 in the two years he coached. My point is, he, he, yeah, he'd done this before. He, he knew what it felt like to run a game even a small college basketball game. J.J. Redick only played basketball, and he was a pretty good player for a very long time. He was only a part-time starter. He started about half the games he played in in the NBA. He started for the Clippers out here for Doc for four years, and then he went to Philly and did start for that year. So he has five years of starting experience. But... Was he considered as a player, a dynamic leader as a player? No, not really. He, he was kind of a role player. He was a three-point shooter and a great three-point shooter, but not a team leader, not, not a point guard. So, so it, often you project the point guard to be a head coach. And yet I look at what happened. You, you know, I keep hearing that J.J. has, you know, extraordinary basketball IQ. Well, I, I'll buy that from listening to their podcast. We, we know, we hear him talk on TV. But help me out here. Higher IQ than Steve Nash? I, I doubt it because Steve Nash has, it's, it's way up there, trust me. And he was a back-to-back -back MVP and was a dynamic leader of the Phoenix Suns. And then what happened? When, when he got his first shot with no coaching experience, Again, he got thrown into a really difficult situation with some really difficult to handle superstars that he was trying to juggle, and it flamed quickly out. Mm -hmm. So that would indicate, well, this, this might not work, but I, I have no idea. All I know is when we talk about building a staff, the truth is the lead assistant right now for the Los Angeles Lakers is LeBron James. Mm -hmm. And I keep harking back to Byron Scott. You had him on your podcast. We had him on this show sitting right there in Rachel's seat. And what was the first thing he said about the Lakers situation? And, and he, he wasn't kidding. He, he was actually... Tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but, but he was a little bitter about it because he doesn't like to see head coaches done wrong. And he thought Darvin Ham had been done wrong. Oh, 100%. Right? No, when you, and, when you look at... When you look at it now on its face... Yeah. I, I kind of feel the same way. Yeah. Like when I look at it, you yeah. know, now yeah. that JJ is officially hired, exactly. you look at it yeah. and you go, wait a minute, man, you had a two. Wait, wait, wait a minute, man, I'm with you on that. But Byron was saying, well, LeBron should just go ahead and coach it. Well, I think he has a chance to be sort of a player coach 
because he and JJ obviously are close from the podcast and they have good connection on the podcast. I don't know how close they are off the field or off the floor, but at least they have a pretty deep connection and I think they'll be able to communicate at a very high, quick level where LeBron can help him just the way a lead assistant would help him. And yet, the, the only issue I have with this whole process was, you know where I, I would be more impressed? Is if right away, if, if they had fired Darvin Ham one day and two years, I'm sorry, two days later, mm -hmm. they had hired J.J. Redick because yeah. they had it all set up and they, they said, that's our guy. We had targeted J.J. Redick from the start. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say, whoo. I'd, I'd get goosebumps. I'd say, maybe they found Pat Riley. Mm -hmm. But as you kept pointing out about Pat Riley, he was an assistant coach for the Lakers. He knew the team from the inside out for, what was it, a couple of years? Yeah. yeah. Okay? Not only that, you go back to not just an assistant coach. He was in the organization. Yeah. yeah. So right. he understood the, the right. Dr. Buss, and he just understood the organization, whether it was him calling the games with Chick Hearns or him on the bench. Yeah. Okay. So... I got to know Pat a little bit in his first two or three years with the Lakers, and I was around him a lot in media situations. Trust me, he was a tough guy. He, 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 had, he had powerful charisma where the locker room listened to him. They already knew him, but he obviously inherited an all-time great team. We get that. But he was commanding from day one. I don't know if JJ's commanding or not because we've never seen him in this situation. I, I have no idea. Maybe you would have some feel for it, but can he walk in and just take a locker room over? Again, as a player, he wasn't Doc Rivers when he played. He, he came straight from sort of playing to coaching. He, he was a leader of the team. And I looked down, so Steve Nash, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Steve, Kerr. Steve Kerr. I covered those Bulls. Steve Kerr was kind of the unofficial spokesman for the yeah. team. When we needed a quote, when we needed it put into perspective, we went to Steve Kerr. Because Michael could be a little distant and difficult with the media where he, he just didn't want to get involved. Okay, but, but Steve Kerr had leadership. You could just see it where everybody looked up to Steve Kerr. And he was a starter for that team. Okay, and then Mark Jackson. He, he was the leader of those Knicks teams that he played for. And when he stepped in, he Pacers, took over. Knicks, all right? that type of team. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Dave McMenamin keeps, he said this several times. He said that from the start, their list was this it was Jason Kidd, Ty Lu, and JJ Reddick. And I'm like, when I look at that list, I think of the, it's like the equivalent of LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and Max Christie. You know, like, like right? right? That's kind of the, the, the order, the pecking order. Then we're down to Max Christie as a, as a potential head coach, right? Is J.J. Redick? Well, they weren't going to get Jason Kidd, right? right? They, they, they weren't going to get Ty Lue because they had some bad blood history, right? Yeah. Okay? So then they, they interviewed J.J. Redick. And then all of a sudden, we've talked and talked this to death, and I don't want to beat the dead horse of Dan Hurley, but, mm -hmm. but Dan Hurley just swoops in, kaboom, and all of a sudden they say, yes, yes, we'll take you, and we will offer you six years, $70 million. And then you're saying, well, that's not nearly enough. And I'm saying, for Dan Hurley, that's a lot of money because he, there's some X factor there whether he can translate into pro basketball, right? No, it's right? not enough. If yeah. you, it, look, it wasn't enough. If they wanted to get it done, they should have just... And he'd okay. a little bit more money to get it done. Now, you say the pecking order, right? One, two, three. Yeah. He was never three. And the reason he wasn't three is because Dan Hurley was able to come in and bump <laughs> him down well, the floor. So I don't know what he was. Three. I, he was I, never three. And okay. one and two were never going to happen. And, and one th and that two is were a fact. never going to happen. That is such a fact. It was never going to yeah. happen. So when they came up with the plan of trying to find a head coach, they, they had to usher Darwin Ham out of the building immediately. Because the two superstars, for whatever it's worth, they never said it. I'm just looking at body language as an athlete and facial expression on the players in quotes after the season. Yeah, especially of, the one Rachel pointed out from Anthony. Go ahead. Yeah, not yeah. just from Anthony, mm -hmm. but also where they start talking about he wasn't prepared, he come in late, all of those. You start looking at that, it's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That is a player's move more so than an owner front office move. And what I mean by that is once the players start to sour on 
They have to, as you know, Rachel, move on from Darwin Ham. They can't try to make nice. It just won't happen because you you gotta you gotta cater to your superstar players. Now, whether or not the superstar player said, "I'm out of here. I want to get traded, and I'm not signing back unless you keep uh, get rid of him," that's not what I'm saying. I don't need to verbally say anything. I, they can see the same things I see, which is, you're not challenging that. We not playing defense. Oh, and they sit back and they go, okay, mm -hmm. we got to do something about this. And they didn't have a plan in place they at the time. They did not have a plan. That was the biggest issue that I had with Jeannie Buss and Rob Polinka. Mm. Now, you look at some of the other first-time head coaches, Rachel, you've been covering this league for a long time. Mm -hmm. Whether it was Jason Kidd that failed early on to a degree. Mm -hmm. But since then, he's learned because he's been on benches. Mm -hmm. He's been on benches. I think Isaiah Thomas was a first-time head coach that really never had any real experience as an assistant. It, it happens, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Are the Lakers willing to wait, though, it out and let the growing pains happen and then see in year three of J.J.'s career where he is at, opposed to if all of a sudden you look up and he wins, what did we finish, the eighth seed this year? And all of a sudden he's the sixth seed, are we happy and said, oh, there's improvement because they're going to spin it that way if that's the that case. Right. You should be better because of LeBron James and AD. Look, there is a chance he is a buffo box office success. We have seen it before. Doc Rivers came in with no coaching mm -hmm. experience and was named coach of the year in his rookie season he as was. a head coach. It is possible. Larry Bird came in, did he an did. excellent job. Right? And then we've seen it again. Steve Kerr, obviously, he had inherited a team that was already very well coached and, and very talented. Thanks to Mark Jackson. But, yep. yes, mm -hmm. but he did it. It could have been a disaster, mm -hmm. and he didn't. So there is absolutely precedent that J.J. Reddick could come in here and do a great job. It's possible. J.J., in the way he's different from Darvin Ham and some of the other coaches the Lakers have had, is he is super into analytics. He is super into very precise, this is what we need to do. Sort of like, you know, how Boston was like, we're going to shoot threes all the time yeah. because this is how it matches our personnel and these are the statistics and these are the odds. J.J. is going to be doing stuff like that. He also is maniacal about preparation. I have been around him both as a player, as a media person. He is going to be, you talk about complaints about Darwin coming late or not being prepared or Anthony Davis saying that he's not prepared. None of that's going to happen with J.J. Redick. J.J. Redick is a prep guy and he will spend this summer up until training camp preparing and every game he will come in prepared. However, the reason this could go completely the other way is that you can only prepare for the situations you know about. And as a first-time head coach, you don't know what you don't know. And when you look at, they say, oh, we're going to surround him with elite staff, how much elite staff is even out there to get hired? Some of the names that I've heard are very unlikely, right? Jared Dudley. He's already an assistant coach in Dallas. Love and, Jared Dudley. But, right. And by the way, he's super popular in the Lakers yeah, locker room. Yeah. But Dallas he, wants to keep him. He's in a really good spot. And that's yeah. a team that just went to the I NBA know. Finals. Correct. Sam Cassell yeah. is a name that's one of the first names that hey, gets bandied about. Know, all the time. Sam Cassell, why, why am I going to the Lakers? Uh, I'm just saying, Lakers. Sam Cassell just won an NBA title okay. with Boston. They're favorites to win. So he's not coming. So I do think that Scotty Brooks, there's our, there are Brett Brown, there are coaches out there that could help J.J., but it's not like there's, like, a ton of them but sitting would, around. Would Brett Brown, as much as he's done, would he leave Pop to come right. to the... I, well, that's I, the thing. With you, Wimby and... Don't I, I don't know. Would, would you really... Would you leave to, to be the lead assistant for the Lakers? I, I don't know. Honestly, the biggest harbinger of J.J.'s success is going to be what happens with the roster in the next six weeks. Because you can say what you want about Darvin Ham and his rotations. He didn't have the right guys to put in his rotations in the first place. And I know what you're saying about Rob Polinka, but that was a failure this past season. Well, yeah, so. yeah, this, this, this past season. But, I mean, if you just look at the body of work and some of the things that he was able to do as a first-time guy. He's got to do better, right? Yeah. He has some trade assets, but not as many trade assets as a lot of other teams around the league. And he has needs that match a lot of other teams around the league. They need a two-way wing. In fact, they could use two of them. So do a lot of other teams. So there will be competition for those guys. Yeah. They need a big man who can sort of push Anthony Davis to the fore, which is where his preferred likes to play. And we'll talk later about what J.J. can do for Anthony Davis. Well, there's other teams who want that. Phoenix could use a quality yeah. big man. So I, I just think there's some variables with we're going to get him elite coaching staff. We're going to get him the best roster. <laughs> we, we don't know. Okay. I'm going to defend Rob Polinka on one count. Mm -hmm. These four players barely played last yeah, they year. Got hurt. Yeah. Listen, 
Jared Vanderbilt and Gabe Vincent and Christian Wood and Cam Reddish barely played last year. Okay, if, if you put those four in there, you got a much better chance to me, especially starting with, with your defender and it Jared Vanderbilt. It probably a little different. Yeah. A little it, bit different. It, it just would. Now, back to Rob Palenka's track record is part and parcel of this stat, and that is the Lakers have finished better than seventh in the West only one time in the last nine years, only once in nine years better than seventh in the West, and that was when you finished first in the pandemic year and went and won the Mickey Mouse championship. With a coach that you then yeah. fired. Well, well, that, that's, that's correct. <laughs> but that's... Right. But but this is almost like cowboy esque here because you keep saying they're the Lakers, but then they don't they don't back it up, and the Cowboys don't they haven't backed it up for like thirty years. Well, but that's, that's the, a whole that's going to be one of the biggest problems that JJ faces as a head coach. This is and I know we talked about some of the other greats going on to be first time head coaches, mm -hmm. but they weren't coaching the Lakers. Yeah, that's that the, the seat is already having flames underneath it. Okay, this is already hot. When he's walking into the bit, because it's not, again, they can spin in any type of way they would like if they move from eight to seven or seven to six. They can spin it and say, look, he's done a great job for us. They can cap you out and make yeah. you feel a certain way. But in the end, you can see exactly what it is. All right? And so now, one of the things, like Rachel was saying, in about six weeks, that's what it's going to tell you. What does this roster look like? Yeah. What do we make any significant trades? Do we bring in some other guys from an asset standpoint? I don't care about the draft because I don't even know who's in the draft. But in the end, what what is he starting October off with? All right. I got it. This is where I also feel sorry for him going forward. He's in a tough spot because of what appear to be factions that are split in the Lakers front office. And my my first example of that was you said you had a good source, which I completely believe and trust, inside the Lakers who told you, I don't know, a month ago. There's two months no, almost. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> two two months, months, yeah. There's no way J.J. is going to get this job because whoever your source is believed with all his or her heart and soul, there's no way J.J. Redick is going to coach this team, right? Okay, and I'm not doubting your source. I'm just, that that's faction versus faction. Somebody inside is saying, seriously? And then somebody else said, yeah. Well, and then somebody else said, well, maybe that's all we're left with here is that that's our that, best that, option, and, right? and that is exactly, yeah. it, that is exactly the way it went. Okay. It wasn't, again, he wasn't the choice. They offered somebody else the job. Okay. Think about it. They and, offered somebody else the job. And they did the job. offer that college coach with no NBA experience about $12 million a year. You said it wasn't nearly enough, and I got you, but but it was still about $12 million a year. And they just gave J.J. reportedly about $8, $8 million a year for four years instead of six years. Still good money, but, okay. but again, how's J.J. feeling about he, – he, he's got to know he wasn't first choice, and he didn't get offered Dan Hurley money. Right? I, I, I think he's I think okay. He's, okay. I was gonna say, he's got player money. I, I think he's he fine. Has a media empire that can continue yeah. on without him because it's not just his podcast, which I yeah. assume he won't do anymore. Yeah. He's got other podcasts and other things coming in. And he wanted this job really badly. Yeah. That yeah. has been obvious. He would like to be a head coach. This is a fast track to get to do it. And it's one of the most elite programs that you can have in the country. It is so, that. of course, I think he will be just fine with his $8 million. And there's million. one thing I am sure about J.J. Reddick he will be huge box office for this team because, man, I'm on the edge of my seat. How's it going to work? Is he going to flame out immediately or what? I mean, look, he has LeBron and AD. If he could just sit back and allow them to play and coach them enough and not get in the way, he'll be successful. They'll win yeah. with just those two. Sure. They'll win with just I'll those buy two. I'll that. They'll yeah. win enough games, and if he gets the right assistance to teach him you know, certain things that he may not know as a coach. Because even as a player, a lot of players know more than coaches, believe it or not. He may be one of those players that knew more than all of his coaches. He just couldn't express his feelings okay. because he wasn't a superstar player that could do that. Can he translate that into leading the team? I, it, it just, it, it all depends on who's buying in. Yeah. Is Anthony Davis buying in? I know LeBron, for whatever it's worth, is probably buying in. Well, he he will until it goes south, and then he might. Yeah, this oh. feels different. Yeah. Yeah. This All feels right. different with him. Okay, we got to talk about the move of the day or night. 
yesterday, first big NBA postseason splash. Alex Caruso for Josh Giddy, who won the trade. Thanks for watching, Undisputed fans. Do you want more highlights from the show? Make sure to click that subscribe button for all the exclusive content from Undisputed.